And we are live from Las Vegas. Welcome to the latest Danger Play podcast. This is Mike, and I'm with my co-host. Jay is in the house. Today we have an amazing guest. It is Marcus Reinhardt. I told you we don't mess around. He is currently on the cover of Iron Man magazine, and he's going to talk to you about training and nutrition. And he is very outspoken and not afraid to tell it like it is. He doesn't bow down to any party lines because he is his own man. So this is very exciting. I'm going to hand over the microphone to Jay, and he and Marcus are going to talk training for a while. Awesome. Hey, Danger and Play audience. Welcome back. It's Jay, obviously, and I'm talking here today with world-renowned world renowned HIT bodybuilding trainer Marcus Reinhardt. Uh, Marcus is actually, as Mike said, uh, on this month's cover of Iron Man magazine and uh, truly is one of the greatest bodybuilders probably of the last 20 years. Um, he trained me um, for about a year in Las Vegas back in 2010 and 2011, and um, we wanted to have him come on today and really just talk about HIT, talk about what it is, how it differs from different training methodologies and protocols out there, where Marcus learned about HIT training and, and who trained him and how he became who he is today. So without, with that said, and without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Marcus. Marcus, welcome to the studio today. Hi, Jay. How you doing? Good to have you. So, so talk to us a little bit about HIT training, Mark. Okay. Tell us a little bit about how you how you found out about oh, it. I found you know, out about it. Just your whole well, background. Generally, in mind, I've been speaking. Of, I've been speaking. I've been. I've been training since the age of sixteen, and uh, I was always a very lazy bodybuilder. So uh, my, my my training protocol was very brief and intense. Before before I even knew about Mike Menzer and Arthur Jones and all the you know all the, all the HIT stuff. Uh, later on, when I moved to Las Vegas, I mean I moved to LA. Las Vegas later on, but when I moved to LA, I met Mike Menser, and Mike Menser introduced me to high intensity training, heavy duty training. Where actually, bre- heavy duty training and HIT are similar, but the high intensity training is followed by Arthur Jones. And uh, what Arthur did back then was he literally said there is going to be one set per exercise um, done uh, with compound movements, doing about 10 to 12 exercises in a row in a circuit fashion. And then once you uh, completed that to failure, you get out of the gym, you cover, um, and you go back in there maybe two or three days later and do the same thing again. So that was the original concept of high intensity training back in the days. Arthur was um, the inventor of Nautilus machines. He was the inventor of high intensity training. The idea of that one set alone will generate enough, enough, um, how can I say, um, stimulation in order to for the muscle to uh, to grow and adapt later on. So. It, you know, it's really the question between the multiple set training and the on the one set theory. Meaning, I mean, if you do one set, is it enough for the muscle to grow? Or do you have to have three or four, or five or six or seven different sets? And that's what, what that was different between the the high intensity community and the volume training guys is that they think that you need to do multiple sets in order to induce growth and and, and, and stimulate growth. And it's not true. There's a lot of scientific studies been done about that. It only takes one working set, hardcore, all the way up to the point where your muscles fail in order to produce growth and stimulate growth. So um, let me pick up from there. So, um, so to a lot of the guys out there in the audience listening, um, you guys really, when Marcus talks about one set to failure or one set type of training, I mean, honestly, unless you've actually worked with a trainer or someone who's competent in teaching uh, an HIT uh, protocol, you have no idea what he even means by that. And, and, and you know, Mike's over there uh, in the room right now too. But just to, just to give a little bit of credibility to that, in order to do a real HIT set, to take your body to absolute positive muscle contractual failure, you can't even comprehend how intense and how tough it is, how much focus needs to be in your head just to be able to do it. Well, well Jay, why don't, you, why don't you elaborate on that and Marcus too? Because I think a lot of people think Failure means, oh, I do 10 reps on the bench, mm-hmm. I, 8 reps, 9 reps, 10 reps, I put the weight on the bar, whoo, that was one set, I failed. Now, right. is that really what failure means under mm-hmm. high-intensity terminology? No, uh, failure means to become, to get to the point where you're positively not able to do another, another rep, no matter what, whether I put a gun to your head or not, and that's it. And that's pretty much the positive aspect, positive failure meaning you can't no longer lift the weight in control fashion, which we are... Which, whereas HIT guys do, we, we move weights very slowly, very controlled, um, and we get to the point where you know, we get to the point where you absolutely cannot move the weight anymore. And then once that has a comp- has been accomplished, you have set the growth stimulus into motion, and that's all you need. And then the, the the problem is that a lot, even if you're doing two or three sets, doing it that way, any further set than one set to failure will only lead to overtraining. For the majority of people, unless you're a genetic freak and you can get away with doing three or four right. sets like or, that, or take you know massive I mean? amounts of drugs, um, right? J- just to add to what Marcus is saying, 
Um, the average guy, when you walk into a gym, and a lot of you guys out there, listeners, you know, you go into a gym and you do three or four sets, of, you know, for an exercise, and then you do, you know, three exercises for body part, whatever. I mean, if Marcus was training you, for example, like he would probably. He would correct your form. He would correct your technique, your strategy, everything you were doing right. so quickly and so efficiently that you wouldn't be able to do – I know this sounds crazy, but you wouldn't actually be able to do three exercises in 12 sets because no. he would push you to no. a level after one or two sets in one exercise where you literally, like right. he says, you would have hit positive muscle failure and you'd have nothing left. Right. But the thing is that the majority of people – and I, I take a lot of people that come from the uh, the, the old volume approach of, you know, doing the three or four sets with – with five different exercises and adding up to like 25 sets per muscle group, it's very difficult to get them to do only three or four working sets to failure because they think that, wow, how is that enough you know, right. for me to know? But the thing is that it, it takes some time. So you take them up, you know, you know, you take them down from maybe like doing 15 sets to, like, to, to cut this down to maybe 10 and then down to five right. eventually. The thing is that it's a psychological thing. So if you know you only have one set that you can actually, you know, hit that, you know, important um, uh, stimulus, you know, with one set only, then you're going to give it all you can to do that. Right. But if you're knowing that you're doing four more sets afterwards, psychologically, you're never going to go go all out in the first set because you know you have four more sets coming afterwards. So it's it's you know knowing that there is one set only means this is it. It's like one bullet that will kill you. You better aim it at the right spot, or not. The guy is going to walk away. Right. One <laughs> one of the things Marcus, as well said, Mar one of the things that Marcus taught me, and then of course I taught Mike about four years ago was that there's really two forces in your training that you need to eliminate, okay? And that is ego and momentum. Mm -hmm. And guys, I'm not bullshitting you. And, you know, Mike can echo on this and then, you know, we'll let Marcus elaborate. But almost every one of you motherfuckers goes into the gym and this is your thought process. Okay, I'm going to lift, you know, X for the bench or whatever weight you're doing for whatever exercise you're doing and I'm going to get X number of reps and then the next time I come in, I'm going to do that again. Well, let me tell you something. I guarantee you that 95, probably even 96, 97% of you guys are using momentum in right. lifting that right. maximum amount of weight. And what you're I, not working with a weight that you can get to maximally fire muscles. The, the thing about that is that the majority of bodybuilders nowadays, they think of training as being a weightlifting event. This is not what it is. Bodybuilding and, and, and building muscles is about contracting muscle fibers to the highest possible you know, ability. In other words, it's not about lifting weights, it's about contracting fibers right. as efficient as possible. And how do you do that? By doing slow, controlled movements to failure. Um, if you're doing anything fast, you're involving momentum. Uh, momentum is an outside force which will lower the amount of fi fiber contraction. Um, it's going to be easier to do that. You can be, you're able to do more weight that way, but the fibers itself don't get the stimulus that it needs in order to grow. Right, and, and failure what when Marcus says failure, it again is, unless you trained with him, you don't. It's, it's hard to explain what it means. But failure would mean imagine you're doing a chin up and you do, you know, 15 or 20 reps on the chin up, and then oh, I can't do anymore. Well, no, no, no. You've only hit positive failure. Positive is meaning the lifting portion of the movement. Then you have to hit isometric failure, which mm -hmm. means you have to contract at the very top of the movement. Fully contract your position. Until you can no longer do an isometric movement. Right. And then you have to hit the eccentric movement, so then you're lowering your body until you completely lose the ability to even yeah. lower your body. Even lower. That is failure. Like yesterday, Marcus trained, um, he trained me yesterday, and we trained back in delts. And, and, and just to go back to like a, a understanding a movement from a back standpoint, like, Marcus will train, he may do two exercises, he may just do one exercises and again, just take you to complete failure. But I'll give you like a sample yesterday of, we do a Nautilus pullover machine and we go and do as many reps as I can until I get to positive failure. And then he'll help me with like four or five or maybe even six where it's just he, I'm controlling the eccentric and he's doing the positive. So he's mm -hmm. taking my muscle to, a deep to road. exactly to <laughs> exactly. And then we'll stop and I'll jump up and I'll go to a close grip pull downs, a very, very, very stretch and very contracted um, mm -hmm. close grip pull down to, again to failure. So, and, and, and no rest other than the time it takes from right. move from so exercise to exercise. The concept behind this whole thing is really pretty much simple. If I want to, if I want to compare it to something else, like for example, the sun, a sun exposure. Um, if you're going out to the pool right now and you're going to lay out for like this right now, this climate and everything else, you, you're probably going to need two hours in order to be able to get tan. You do that in July, you'll be burned in 10 minutes. Right. Okay. So the intensity, the, the concept is the same. The sunlight will expose stress on your, on, on your skin. The, the body's going to react with a suntan as a protective barrier. Um, but the intensity in the sunlight and in the July is much higher than it is in 
what we got now it's what, February. February so in February the sunlight is very low so you need more time and but the concept is the same so there's a limited amount of of, of, of your body's resources that can that can be tapped into and, and until you get that and then you're gonna start you know you're gonna start burning with blisters of course so it's a, it's a very fine precise way of it's almost like a, a medicine you have to inject just the right amount in order to get it but it's still it's gonna have to be intense and effective and um, uh, with training like this it has to be brief it cannot be long it can never be long a workout like this should never be lasting longer than about 20 to 30 minutes after 30 minutes you walk out of the gym and Mike Mike share share with what your thoughts are I mean literally you you're shaking for 15 minutes you can't you know like most of you guys you drink a pro workout shake you want to grab something to eat well let me tell you something you can't even eat your endocrine system has been elevated so high and you've been pushed to your limits that you're not thinking about anything for 15 or 20 minutes after this workout ends yeah, yeah like like most people I never really understood high intensity training because everybody sort of mocked Mike Menser and everybody said well one set to failure isn't enough but that was again because people don't understand what it means to, to, to attain failure mm -hmm. and you don't under, understand failure until you train with someone like Marcus or in my case I'd seen that Jay's body literally transform and I said what, do, what are you doing man what are you on and he's like nothing man he's the same <laughs> as always and he said well I started training with this guy Marcus Reinhardt right so I came out and just trained with Jay and and the first time I, I trained, I just sat at, at, after a set, and we used Nautilus machines too. We weren't even bench pressing or anything else. Right. We were on a Nautilus machine, and I, my whole body was overheating. I was completely yeah. sweat just yeah. from just from one one set, and was completely blown away. And then I said, "Oh, now I finally understand what it means mm -hmm. to attain failure." So, so let's ask some questions then about this, so so guys can really understand. So, Marcus, you know the one question that's always asked of you. And by the way, guys, Marcus is actually going to be speaking next weekend in Minnesota at one of the leading or foremost uh, exercise science the hit resurgence. Yeah, it's called HIT resurgence. Mm -hmm. But like, literally, like most of the great minds in exercise science and exercise physiology today will be there. And Mar Marcus is actually the. And we're not talking speaker. about the people that have twenty-two inch arms. We're talking about right. people that have twenty-two inch brains. <laughs> exactly. You know what I mean? People not that not really, the meathead that community. Really they think, they think, they analyze things and they look at the stuff. I mean, I'm like, I'm a big dude and I have big arms. I know why they are big, but at the same time, it's a it's a matter of genetics. Okay? The fact that my triceps, for example, are a certain way and they look has nothing to do with the fact that I train them a certain way. So right. there's only one thing you're going to be able to, if you train, if you train, you're going to have to get stronger. As you're getting stronger, you're adding more muscle size and that's it for anyone. You know, um, and you know, like hit resurgence. The people are up there; they're they're very much, um, uh, you know, whether it's you know basketball related or any any kind of strength development. They're taking that and they're using that to teach within other sports as well. Right. Because you know, the problem with 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 with, with training, you know, CrossFit and and even football, is that um, the people, the coaches, believe that there's some somehow you have to go in there and you have to perform some crazy ass exercise in order to be a better football player or, or basketball player which will hurt the athlete in the right. meanwhile and, and uh, it really it all comes down to one thing is strength training and strengthening has to be a very controlled way and HIT is going to be the best thing to do for all these type of sports whether it's whether it's UFC fighting whether it's boxing whether it's you know uh, um, um, any type of sport you can think of um, your strength is up your performance will be up but if you want to be a good boxer or a good fighter, you better get in the ring and start fighting. So, you know. And, and, and Marcus makes a good point too that HIT training is great for combat fighters because the, the trend now is is mm -hmm. they do everything. They want to train like Trick a bodybuilder. Yeah, all guys that. will say, oh, you know, I'm training BJJ. How do I get training for BJJ? It's like, well, you need to train your jujitsu. That's your skills training. Why are you right. in the gym for five hours? A week. Why are you in the gym for six hours a week? Why are you doing like oh, they're two, Yeah, exactly. They're two or three rep deadlifts, and that's why if you see leading up to a fight, even at the professional level, guys are always getting injured. Right. And they're injured because they're spending way too much time doing right. strength and conditioning. It's already enough enough that they are going to a ring where they are going to be potentially injured and and, and beaten to death. <laughs> so <laughs> right. so so just leave this. This is going to be part of their job. This is what it is. But in the meanwhile, outside that, they're going to have to do something that's very secure and safe. To where they they're getting stronger, and you know the whole thing about you know explosive strength and strength endurance. Trust me, it's all you don't have to worry about all that. Get strong in the gym, perform movements slow and controlled, and explosive training is simply stupid. Just like Arthur Jones said in the seventies, that was a, I mean like what how long, forty years ago he already mentioned that way way ahead of his time is saying that any any time you're excelling in a weight, 
You're exhaling away, you're taking away the amount of fiber contraction, right. and you potentially are going to injure yourself. So, so, so with that said, so let's talk about that. Let's expound a little bit about that. And, 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 and no offense to a lot of you guys out there that may be doing this stuff, but like, share your thoughts on like all this stuff, and I'll call it nonsense that you see in the gym now today with personal trainers, you know, doing mm-hmm. this ballistic movements, you know, using balls, I right, mean, right, all right, this right. nonsense that you see. I mean, elaborate a little well, bit. I, on I that. believe that the majority of trainers are completely um, confused. Um, and they're confused, and some will listen. They'll tell them something and all that, but they, you know, they sort of want. They, they've done it so, for such a long time, so now they're not going to really want to want to listen to me because they feel like an asshole afterwards. Oh shit! I just you know did, spent two years having people right. bounce on bozo balls. You know, um, the thing is that um, all these all these exercise things that they do, whether it's a bozo ball, whether it's a, it's a plyometric jump on a box or up and down, <laughs> it, it's it, it, it's it's simply criminal. To do that for the client and uh, to accept money for that on top of that, it, that that's I don't even know. What, <laughs> you know, all that is is you, you're putting some, someone in a position where they can potentially get injured, whether it's an athlete or whether it's a re- regular person, and you make it some sort of a weight loss pro- program. Weight loss happens in the kitchen; has nothing to do with training at all. Right. It's two different entities all, all, all together. You diet properly, you will lose weight. Okay. The, the layers on top of your muscles will disappear. The layers of fat on top of your muscles will disappear. Your skin will, th- will get thinner. And whatever you're building underneath that will come up and appear. Um, and, you know, with high-intensity training, you're able to do that much faster with less time spent. And you do that, and you're never going to have an injury. Never, ever. I don't care how much weight you're pressing. As long as you're pressing it in a controlled fashion, you will not get injured. Never, That's true. Ever. So let, let's elaborate on that real quick. Let's talk about like a sample HIT workout. Like let's just use like, let's use a client of yours who's a, who, who's not a bodybuilder, just an average person out there who wants to look better naked. Right. Give a program. The average person that comes into the gym and says, you know, I never worked out in my life and I want to lose some weight and I want to look better and fit and be stronger. Um, you know, of course I value at first what kind of inju- injuries they had, if they had any injuries. There's some of the things that are, that we can do, but for the most part with HIT, uh, <laughs> Because we are training such an, in such a slow fashion, you'll never get someone injured like that. Um, training to failure will not injure you. Training with explosive movements will injure you. My, my basic concept workout is for someone like that, about 10 exercises with compound movements um, for the entire body. So I'll be working the entire body, just like Arthur Jones did that back in the 70s, right. and I will train that person to about two or three times a week. Now, because of the fact that that person is so new to it and he's not able to lift a whole lot of weight, obviously he's, he's too weak for that. He's too weak to to um, to inroad the body to the point where he can't recover from it. You understand? Right. So in other words, he can train three times a week chest. Right. And he will make progress from it because his weights are so little that, that right. you know. But as they are getting stronger going through this workout, um, the adjustments need to, be, need, need to be made within that person individually of how much of that weight training, how much of that you know, HIT session they can tolerate. So right. I might take two or three ex- exercises out of it, or I might switch them over to a lower body and upper body routine. Right. You know, eventually the point where they get so strong, I, I split them up into like you know a chest, shoulder, triceps routine. Right. Taking a day off, doing you know back and biceps, taking a day off, doing legs, taking a day off, so forth. So it's always a, 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 it's a matter of training, and then right afterwards recovery, and then training again. So it, it's it's really a fine tuning between the person that's working out. And then doing it again, and then recovering in between. Because when you are training and working out, nothing happens except that you're inroading your body. Right. Okay. It's a stress. As you're doing that, your body wants to go ahead and recover first. When the recovery process is completed, then there's a super compensation, which causes more muscular, you know, muscular strength and 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 uh, added tissue. As long as you're eating enough food. Now, if you're not eating enough food, that you, you can't build any tissue on top of that. You're gonna you're just gonna be stronger, but you're not gonna be more muscular. Now and now, when you train people, what you would would you like to talk maybe about rep tempo? Because mm-hmm. I've seen your videos on YouTube where you train deadlift with with Mike Menser, and I saw actually some guy said, "Well, this guy, big guy should be able to Do deadlift a lot more. Pounds, why yeah. isn't he deadlifting 500 pounds? Yeah, looking at those are fake that. muscles. Good. But when but when you actually understand why he's lifting the way he's lifting, it makes complete sense. Correct. So so well, before Marcus answers, uh, just I, I train I deadlifted with Marcus or Marcus trained me yesterday. I did deadlift and just to, to elaborate on Mike what, what Mike said when when you're training in HIT fashion, okay, 
as Marcus will always say, you have to control the movement. Okay. You have to control the weight. So no matter how strong you are or how big you are, how good your form or any of that stuff, what kind of technique you have, your mm-hmm. leverage, how, how, how tall or short you are, mm-hmm. it's about controlling the weight. So Marcus is never going to make you move a weight. You're not trying for maximals. You're not trying to, no. you know, to deadlift 500 pounds no. for one or two reps. You're trying to take your body and that muscle that you're taxing at that moment to positive failure and, and perhaps beyond. So like, for example, you have to say like, I can deadlift 225 pounds for 10 reps, easy, no problem. But when I trained with Marcus yesterday to do one set to kill myself, I did 185 pounds and I literally got to the point where my hands failed and I literally dropped the weight. Right, 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 right. Yeah, I mean, again, with the issue of momentum and, and, and force and, 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 and throwing around weights, you have to, you know, check your other door, drop the weight by 30 to 40% of what you used to do. Because, right. you know, if you ever trained before, bench pressing 300 pounds or whatever, you can probably, you know, in an HIT set, only do about 225, 200 maybe 200 yeah. pounds. Uh, and because of the fact we're doing such a slow cadence and, 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 and moving the weight slowly. Now, the thing about it is though, that, 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 you know, a lot of people in the high intensity community always go, they go a little bit too far into one direction. That means that they're saying, well, now let's go ahead and move the weight even slower than that. Let's go to like 10 second phase up and down. <laughs> and then, you know, and everybody's like, oh no, it's gonna be four, it's gonna be three, it's gonna be, right. you know, they, so they start fighting about that. Really, bottom line is this, and as Arthur Jones said, quote him, move the weight as fast as you can within control, and that is it, pretty much. Perfect. Okay? So uh, if, you, if you're moving a weight uh, within control, you need to be able to aggressively move the weight with, with force in order, to, uh, in order to induce some sort of a stimulus. I, I think to just expound on that again, guys, I'm telling you, and Mike can share some stuff on this, you guys don't know what he means by that. And, and, and none of us do until you actually work with him. I mean, right. like for example, let me just give you, like let's say you're just doing a, a, a bench press, a machine. You're doing a leverage machine, a flex machine, whatever. You're just doing a flat press machine. And you start doing eight to 10 reps or whatever it is you're doing for the amount of weight. Like you don't realize, but you're using momentum almost 90% of the mm-hmm. time. I mean, you get to rep four, you get to rep five, your speed on the eccentric is too fast. Maybe you're even, as Marcus says, you know, you're explosively, you're, you're exploding right. out. Right, I mean, right. there's so many little things that you don't right. realize until you have a master HIT trainer right. work with you. Right. For example, I mean, there's two, three. There's three different phases of, of your actual of your actual rep, which is your positive, which is your weakest um, uh, ability to lift the weight. So you're very you're very weak in lifting weights. You know, then you do stronger part, which is your static, which is holding the weight, the asymmetric part of it. And then as you be strongest range, is your negative, is you lowering the weight. Okay. Now, as you get into the positive. You, uh, you at that point you're very weak, and in, in the static you're strong. You can you know hold more weight than that, and then you're lowering it slowly. So it's very important that you are lowering the weight slowly, and that you're pausing in, in a fully static contra- contraction. Um, so you're going down at about let's say let's just say about two two seconds. Which difference? There's a difference between each muscle group because if you're doing a lat pull down, it will right. take more than it does for a calf raise, for example. You right. Know? But again, controlled movement going down into the fully contracted position. The fully contracted position is where all the muscle fibers contract at the fullest. This is where the actual explosion, so to speak, happens in the muscle where all the fibers are going to be like, let's go ahead and you know set the stimulus right there. It's not you lifting the weight. It's you holding the weight and it's you lowering the weight, which is even more inroading into the body's ability to recover. So it's the, it's the inroading part happens during the lowering. So now when, you look, when you're lifting a weight, and you, you're holding it and then you just let it flat back down, you're completely missing out on the lowering part of the movement, which is the most productive part of it. Which is what 90% of guys do. They lose control the of it on the way of down course, because yeah. it's all momentum. Because they're the trying way. to catch back up and go back down. Exactly. So, you know, <laughs> you know, if you're doing it fast, you're able to move, you know, to move, uh, you know, I'd say 300 pounds in a, in a pullover for like 10 reps. But if you're doing it properly, you're probably doing maybe like 180. Exactly. You know? and Mike, Mike, share a little bit about what you and I talked about like three years ago. I mean, guys, um, I'm going to let Mike talk about it. But when you learn to maximally contract muscle fibers, okay, when you get to the point in the mm-hmm. lift where you can literally, as Marcus talks about the static, but literally which is, which flex is a, every which muscle is, which is a skill that has to be acquired that does not all happen overnight some people are, are very good about it very fast and they learn very quickly some will take time to learn that yeah I, i'm sure a lot of you if you're listening to this you think this is a, sounds a little esoteric it's a little abstract and, and i think that's the reason hit training hasn't caught on even though it's so effective is because 
unless you're with somebody who knows how to run you through an HIT workout, you just don't really understand what it means to fail. I didn't understand what it meant before Jay. Jay didn't know what it meant until no. he trained with Marcus, and then now you completely understand it. Failure would be an example. Let's say you're doing uh, you're doing hammer strength press, and you you know you can do four plates, and you can grind out like a good eight to ten reps with raw aggression. Okay, take two take two plates off. Now when you're when you're pushing up, instead of pushing as fast as you can and exploding out like you're throwing a punch, imagine that you're flexing your pecs right. like you're on stage the whole mm-hmm. movement up. Right, yeah. And then when you hit the top of the movement. Don't lock your elbows, and you pause it until the momentum is completely eliminated, mm-hmm. and then you slowly lift it back, and again, instead of just let, letting the weight fall back, you're fighting it back the whole rep. Right. So one repetition might, like, he, like Marcus said, they don't necessarily have a stopwatch, but a repetition might take five or ten seconds because right, right, right. the whole time you're actually flexing your chest, and when you do that, you're going to hit failure, and, and you're going to hit your fiber fibers in your chest way differently than you do otherwise. And, and, and guys, when you know how to maximally contract fibers, and Marcus just hit on it, you know, it's a skill. It, it's not going to happen overnight. You really have to learn how to do it. And oh mm-hmm. my God, the changes that will happen in your mm-hmm. physique. I mean, for you guys out there that are like intermediates, you know, you've been training six or seven years and you probably feel pretty strong about yourself or you look okay when you take your shirt off and you feel confident or whatever. Man, if you could fucking train HIT style for a year, mm-hmm. your body will literally change like you can't comprehend. Well, here, here's the thing and, that, and that's very important that people understand that is that if you are actually truly trained in proper way and you, let's say, in, in a perfect environment, you eat perfectly and you train perfectly, such an with a high intensity training program, you should be able to actually um, get to the point of fully muscular development within about two years. Right. In other words, if you don't reach it in two years, or you know, it's not going to go any different. It's not going to go any further than that. That's going to be Did it. Did you guys hear what he just said? He said that if you know how to train in HIT mm-hmm. fashion correctly, right? Two years. Two years. Two years. In two years. No matter where you're at, you should be able to reach your fully muscular potential. Um, and not you know, 15 to 20 years, like you see some of the pro bodybuilders go on. And I mean, of course, they are advancing and they're getting better. And sometimes you see them looking a little different and more cut and more ripped, more hard, more defined. But the thing is that they're spending a lot of time doing that. They're spending years and years of redefining all that stuff. And then if they would train properly, I believe they would get there a lot faster. And um, But again, you cannot really judge... And high intensity training um, uh, regimen versus what they do. Now, they are huge and tremendous. They're much bigger than I am. But the fact that they are that way has nothing to do with how they train. It's all from drugs, guys. I mean, I mean yeah. you can share. It's well, it's, 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 a so. mi- it's a mixture of, of course, their genetics, which is it, 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 superior genetics, of course. Uh, their discipline, their dedication to what they're doing, and the fact that they're training. That they are doing drugs, and if they are doing these type of drugs, you can get away with all volume. these mistakes. Yes. You can get away with a lot of mistakes and a lot of high volume training, and you still will recover from it because they're such powerful drugs that allow you to do so. Got, no, there, okay. There, there, there's no doubt, guys. I trained for 15 or 16 years, um, and as Mike has already said, and I, you know, and I and I, I got to a level where you know I wasn't pro. I never want to show or anything, but I did a bunch of photo shoots. I was in magazines, but then I trained with Marcus for a year and. I'm pro level, you know, I mean, literally, and this is at 40 years old, you know, so I've won shows now, I've been in magazines, I mean, you know, Marcus, there's no bullshit, I mean, if you know how to train HIT fashion, they could take a person of average genetics um, to to elite levels and a person of elite levels to fucking cartoon proportion. Probably. Correct, correct, you know, but I mean, you're never going to be able to reach the type of development you see nowadays in the magazines, it's not going to be happening, whether you train HIT or whatever you're right. going to do. It's not going to happen. These bodies that you see are only pharmaceutically enhanced bodies that can only exist at them. Not saying there's anything wrong with it. I'm not going to go ahead and say that uh, you shouldn't be doing this, you should be doing that. Bodybuilding has gotten to the point where you have to do it in order to win a show. And it's because of the audience requires or they want to see the freaks and there's no if you're ever going to go back to natural bodybuilding and, and the aesthetic lines of a steve no reeves nobody will be in the auditorium watching it because you can't go back it's like wait it's like watching a formula one race right they don't want to you know they don't want to see the slow freaking car drive around you know what i mean they want to have the fastest damn cars up there i don't give a, they don't care whether these guys get killed out there right and that's what it is you know it's just always a sport so now you people will stare at the sport as a normal person if you are training um, you do not have to take steroids to build muscle. You have to have a, a proper training regimen, a proper balanced diet behind that, and um, allowing yourself to recuperate in between those workouts and, and, and not going to the gym with this idea of the more is better, but the precise amount is what is needed. The precise amount of 
training, recovery, you know, and that's what it all. That's so what it all. So, the precise amount. Uh, let's let's stick on that for one second. Then mm-hmm. I want you to talk a little bit about your nutrition and, and, and what mm-hmm. you believe in nutrition because you have a lot to say on that. But um, so let's take a thirty-year-old guy who listens to this show who's five ten and weighs one hundred and seventy pounds, mm-hmm. and he's been training volume, you know, for the most of his life, and he just started, you know, he just started taking HRT, so he's like taking two hundred and fifty milligrams of test a week or something like that. Mm-hmm. What kind of protocol would you have him on? Give us a sample workout for a guy who wants, say, he wants to add, you know, his nutrition being good. He's already been training for seven or eight years, so he's a little bit beyond a mirror me, and now he's using testosterone at two hundred and fifty right. milligrams a week. How would your workout program be for him? Okay, well, first of all, I would evaluate his ability to train hard and intense. Right. Now, if he comes in there and I will take him through a workout and he's never been used to any of that training, training. I would I would do more volume, I would do more sets. Right. And I would do that because I want him to, to acquire the skill of training properly. Right. And as in, uh, as he's acquiring the skill of training properly, I will start reducing the amount of sets later on as he's getting better at it. So, so a couple of weeks maybe? Let's just say two weeks of doing you know, two or three sets per, per exercise. Right. You know, keeping the exercise between four or five per. If he does, if you're doing a split like a chest right, shoulder tricep right, right, split, right, for right. example, maybe five exercises, two or three sets. That's it. Right. Um, but the intensity is not so much what I'm trying to push at that point. I'm trying to push his skill, ability to to become skilled at what he does, and then later on start dragging it down to the the minimum amount, which is one set to failure. And having that one set of failure when he absolutely fails, and, I, and, and I'm a good judge of that. I can see where he's at. That's true. You know what I mean? I can see, is he pulling the weight correctly still? Is it just going to be some sort of a crippled type of movement? You know what I mean? Right. So you got to adjust. There's a lot, many variables about that. And when you when you see that getting to a point of failure, then you're done. You get to the next exercise. You do that as well. So, you know, about two or three weeks, anybody that I take up, you know, that I take into my workouts, I always start getting him you know, into the into that, that higher volume approach, and then I start taking that down. Um, so probably know, three days a week, probably you'd have them in the so, so Working three days a week is about, about all I would do. I would never train anyone more than three days a week. That would be too much. Right. In, in other words, a new client wouldn't just start off one set to failure. So some, because a lot of guys out here might say, oh, I want to learn more about Mike Mensa. I want to learn about Marcus Reinhardt. Mm-hmm. I don't live in Vegas. I can't train with Marcus. How do I get the most out of HIT just by reading a book and listening to this interview? What what can I do? The books are great, you know, but the thing about HIT and books is that when you write something like this, it doesn't look very impressive on paper. And also, it doesn't teach you the, the amount of intensity that, that it takes and, 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 and you know, the, the whole entire thing about the form and all that stuff. Yeah, because I, I read it Heavy Duty back when I was 23 or 24, and so did Mike. And I'm right. sure a lot of you smart guys have read Heavy Duty and were like, mm-hmm. oh, wow, you know, I experimented with the gym. But let me tell you, you didn't know what the fuck you were doing, okay? I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. Mike didn't know the fuck well, what I was doing. Well, I read doing. it too. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, none Before of us, none of us until you actually can learn from an HIT master Correct. trainer can do jack Correct. shit when it comes to HIT right. training. And right. Marcus, as he said, a little bit before he really can understand he's been in the business for 20 years you know he's he's worked with so many different people and so many different types of bodies he can look at you and he can tell you you know where you need changes you know where you need to tweak where you need improvements and stuff like that so i mean again a competent master trainer which there are not many of them out there as mike's talked about a million times before um when you have someone like that to work with you i mean it, it's it, it's it's really too hard to put into words you know how meaningful and how much it well can help. i mean are, are there youtube videos or are we just gonna say everybody listening to this is, is fucked. YouTube videos? Well, I'm, well yeah. I mean, yeah. Imagine a guy says, "Hey, this sounds great. I want to try I it. Wanna... I don't. I can't train with Marcus. There's right, nobody right, good right, where right, I live. Right. What, what do I do? You know? Do well, do? there's a couple of different things. I mean, there's a, there's some YouTube videos out there. I, I have a channel on um, on YouTube, YouTube uh, forward slash Mr. High Intensity. That's my channel. I put on a lot of videos about form and how to execute certain movements. I got a website, MrHighIntensity.com, which features an entire membership section full of like about 85 videos now of all different types of Hit training programs, um, different structures of it, uh, clips, individual clips, and then long, long, you know, like longer, like 10, 15 minute videos of an entire workout and explaining of some of the things, some of the tr- tricks and things that I've learned throughout the years uh, past Mike Mentor um, that I've adapted to it. And, um, you know, so you really have to see high intensity training in action, whether it's on YouTube or anywhere. I have a DVD out right now, which is called Mr. Hit. Um, it's a two hour DVD featuring the entire. Um, the entire beginner, intermediate, and advanced routine that I recommend for anyone that wants to start off with training, or any, someone that's already advanced, like Jay, for example, he would go up, you know, right into the advanced level routine. He wouldn't go back to that other level. So, um, but so yeah, so YouTube is a great source. Of course, my website is a great source. 
Um, the books itself are cool to read, definitely awesome. Definitely read uh, Heavy Duty 1 and 2 and uh, The Wisdom of Mike Mentor. Those are great books. Um, but other than that, you have to actually see it in action. And then, of course, if people come to Las Vegas, I have my, 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 my high-intensity training camps. They can book me for camps where I do a three-day um, camp here at City Athletic Club. And, and, and Marcus can also consult with a lot of you guys. You know, Just reach out to Mike or myself um, through the blog, and you know we can connect you with Marcus. But, I mean, Marcus does do online consult- consultations. Um, just re- before we end the show, though, I really wanted to spend a couple minutes talking about nutrition because I know – Okay, we have some questions too, but just real quick, I want to just elaborate on Marcus's because Marcus helped me a lot with nutrition. But you know, most of you guys out there think that um, you know nutrition is about you know macronutrients and all these other things, and you know low carb, you know isocaloric, paleo, all the bullshit. I, I want Marcus to talk a little bit about it. Comes down to the amount of calories you're eating, okay? And, and when I say that, guys, I'm not fucking bullshitting you. It really does. I never believed it. I always thought that it was about lowering your carbs and you know eating your perfect macros and blah, blah, blah. But honestly, it just comes down to how much you're eating. I don't give a shit what your genetics right. are, how insulin sensitive you are. It comes down to lowering your calories Absolutely. to a level that will allow you to lose body fat. So with that said, talk right. a little bit about your nutrition, like when you prep for a show. Well, I've been, you know, I've been going through stages myself where I've, I, I've, I've did the low carb diet, and I did the uh, fasting diet, and all that stuff, and all those things always ended up in disaster um, because I listened to the wrong people, and uh, you know, the only time I ever really got into, uh, well, recently I've been doing well because uh, my, my girlfriend Cindy Lai. Um, with GoFitMeals.com, she's an expert on, on nutrition. She knows how to dial someone in for a competition, and, and uh, she also preps meals for other people and, 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 and delivers them here in Las Vegas. They're perfectly combined with you know carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. But it's really a balanced nutrition issue. It's like having a balanced nutrition to 60% carb ratios. You know, and I don't know if you want to tweak it up to 65 or 70. It doesn't matter. It's not so, such such a big deal in this level. It's the matter is calorie calories coming in, eating too many calories, you're gonna get fat. Okay, you cannot gain muscle by overeating. Right. You're gaining muscle right. by training. You're not gaining muscle by eating. You know, you need a, a small, slight surplus of, of, of calorie intake um, in order to gain muscle. On, on the very sl- muscle gains are very slow. They're very gradually slow. They don't come overnight. They don't happen within a month. It's a. It's it's just you have to look at it like six, eight, maybe ten pounds throughout the year. If you're a natural bodybuilder. That's about all you can expect. So do you not need to eat 10,000 calories a day in order to get bigger? All you're going to happen is you're going to get fatter, bloated, and, and, and that's it. So, and, so, that's, so if you guys heard what he just said, all you guys out there that think that you're going to bulk and you're just going to eat and you're going to get big, you're going to get fucking fat. Exactly. The mass gainers, all that kind of stuff. Now, unless you're someone that's really ectomorph, that has absolutely – can't eat enough food, doesn't have time to eat food, or basically eats food – and just burns through them, you know. You might be benefiting from something like a like a mass gaining shake that has 800 calories in it, and you throw in some peanut butter, or whatever it is, to get those calories up. But the average person will need that. And if you are gaining, if you gain, if you're training um, in H- HIT fashion properly, um, you need a balanced nutrition that has a slight surplus of maybe like 150 to 200 calories a day in order to gain muscle on a consistent level. If you're doing more than that, you're very likely you're going to get get fatter. Just fat, and I mean you're gonna get muscle too, but you're gonna get fat at the same time. And who wants to do that? So here's some questions we have from a lot of you guys from Marcus. So with that said, Mark's gonna ask. The, this one is from DJ Main Event, and he has two questions. He said, "What is the best and most effective way to drop body fat? And should a workout geared towards muscular size be based solely on compound lifts?" No, absolutely not. I believe that compound lifts in the past, for example. There were once of those 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 matching exercises that build on size and strength and all that stuff. Yeah. You know? Well, in a compound lift, you are able to move more weight because you you are uh, you know in isolation movements it's a really tougher because you, you can actually injure yourself doing a pec deck with a very heavy weight. But since we are doing HIT and we're moving the weight very slow, you can use you know a pec deck or a cable crossover and build a great chest with it, which are which are probably even better than doing a bench press. There's movement, no doubt about that. You know? So, uh, you know, I had, I used to have a very weak chest. It was pretty much flat. There was nothing there. I had huge triceps, huge shoulders, but no chest. And I was bench pressing 485 pounds. Right. So I was always making that compound movement, the first movement, pressing five, six, with 485, and nothing happened. That damn chest would not grow. So I said, you know what? Forget it. I'm just going to put it away. Let's go ahead and do the flies heavier. Not crazy heavy, but heavier. Slow moving, controlled. All of a sudden, my chest starts blowing up because now you're hitting the you're hitting the actually chest 
isolated, you're hitting the chest the way it should be. And now if you still want to do your compounds, do it at the end of that. Don't do it at the beginning. Because if you do it at the beginning, what's going to happen is your triceps will fail before your chest does. Well, one of the things Marcus showed me, guys, and Mike and I train when we train together. We always do this now. We very rarely do a compound movement before we do a fly. Because if you pre-exhaust the muscle, your development over time is going to be so mm-hmm. much greater. Because as Marcus says, you're not going to be working your ancillary muscles. You're going to be working the prime right. mover. So Correct. for chest, when and you're that. already pre-exhaust, mm-hmm. you're literally just going to be hitting the right. chest fibers. Right. It's always going to be – it's always the weak link, your arms, that's going to be right. in, in play. That When you're doing a pull down, when you're doing a, a chest press, when you're doing a row, your arms will be the weakest link in the chain. Your back is, has a tremendous amount of, of, of strength. So what happens is in order to get that muscle, the back muscle, to, to actually – um, um, you know, get stimulated. You have to put a lot of weight onto it, but your arms will fail before that ever happens. So you have to pre-exhaust your back by doing, for example, a pullover movement where you, you isolate your latissimus muscle to the point of where there's nothing left and you have no more strength left. Then you go into a pull-down movement right after. That. Best or most effective way to drop body fat? Well, the best, the best, and most effective way to drop body fat is just you establish your your, your 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 basic calorie intake. In other words, if you you know, 200 pounds, for example. So let's say 200 pounds, you're taking in about, and it, depending on what condition you are, 200 pounds. If you're a fatty at 200 pounds, you probably want to drop your body, your, your, your calories on to about 1,800 at first. At once, you, you take a step first, 1,800 calories, for example, for about four or five weeks. See how your body fat goes down, how your body weight goes down, and then if you if you get a point where you get stuck. You might want to raise it up a little bit and then go back down. So like a zigzag way of calorie dieting. So calorie cycling. Right. Calorie cycling, I would say, is the best way to go. Um, but you have to always be below your maintenance level. You have to be below the amount of calories you need to sustain your, your body weight in order to drop fat. And that, you know, brown rice, chicken, uh, whole wheat pasta. Try to eat good and, and complex carbohydrates. Try to eat a healthy a healthy so- source of, of carbohydrates and um as far as you know, not going overboard with fats because you won't need that many of it. But um, it's it's really a calorie a calorie zigzag calorie diet uh, up and down, and you have to have patience for it. The majority of people that are dieting are doing it for three days and then they lose. Right. You know what I mean? They do a three day diet and then they go all off, do whatever they want to do, and then they do it again, and then it's like you know, it's like three steps forward and two steps back, and they they might lose a little bit in the process, but it's not going to be efficient enough. You have to be very strict. You got to be on it a hundred percent. Until you reach your goal, and then when you get to you know to the point where you, where you get your goal, you might want to have a cheat day or something like that. Or... Next question. So iconoclast asks, what kind of diet should one use? Paleo, keto, combination of both? Does it matter? I'm. Go ahead. Yeah. So so um, so I think Marcus just hit on the I, really the answer. I mean, really, it comes down to it's calor- it's caloric balance, it's mm-hmm. caloric maintenance, it's figuring out you know what amount or what caloric level allows you to drop body fat okay mm-hmm. so you know there's no such thing guys honestly paleo calor you know isocaloric zone mm-hmm. low carb any of that shit it's all bullshit it, it just all the, comes you know, down to yeah. caloric to caloric amounts what, what happens is that you know the, the industry the health industry fitness industry supplement industry it thrives on those different diet uh, um, phases because they can sell supplements that are based on on, on those type of ideas so whether it's a bar whether it's the the, the balance bar or the uh, the low carb bar, so you know it, it all comes down to that. So uh, it really is a balanced diet. Now the main thing that your muscles are 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 in need of is carbohydrates. If you don't have carbohydrates in your system, your muscles will be flat and won't be able to contract and won't be able to recover from your workouts. It's not protein that makes you recover; it's carbohydrates. And see, see what he just said, guys. I mean, again, a fountain of knowledge. I never believed that. It's totally true. Once I put carbohydrates back in my diet, again, the right type of carbohydrates. You have to have carbohydrates to train. You could never train in HIT fashion without carbohydrates. Give me a fucking break. Ketogenic dieting. I mean, Mike and I can do a separate podcast on ketogenic diet, and we probably will at some point in time, but... Low carb dieting is, is is truly a fad. I mean, if if somebody needs to drop body weight, you know, from water standpoint and stuff like that, yeah. over a three or four day period, they can trick fuck their body, and you can lower right. your carb intake, well, and right you can back. drop water. Exactly, but it, it, there's no purpose of, of low carb dieting long term to build muscle and to maintain muscle. All right, last Next question. Time. We got to head out. Uh, this is from Yash B. He wants to talk about: Is there a difference between sarcoplasmic hypertrophy versus myofibril hypertrophy? So sarcoplasmic good. Well, <laughs> it's getting a little bit more technical than I thought I would get. <laughs> I think that the whole entire idea of uh, people are really overthinking the entire process here. You know what I mean? Um, 
it's basically muscular growth induced by by stress it's the whole thing is based on stress um um theory you know um in other words you're imposing a so stress that, you're imposing right. a stress to the body the body will compensate by building up a stronger muscle and that's it that's it's the same thing if you want to use the analogy of sun tanning uh if you go in you know if you go out in the sun today and you 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 know you're laying out for a certain amount of time your body will build up a, a tan in order to protect yourself from further damage now unless you get to the point where you lay out too long or too intense and you will of course burn and that's pretty much all it is um that 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 happens with all the muscles in your body uh, same thing you know some i don't i don't i don't, I, don't, I really want to get into the whole technical jargon of all that stuff uh, <laughs> other than that it's just you know train hard train intense brief and um you know, make sure that you that you also record and log down what you do. Going to the gym merely by um, going by feeling, by emotions of like, you know, I feel like I want to lift this and that and that weight has nothing to do with training scientifically. You got to go in there with a with a chart. You got to write down what you do, and then you got to go next time. You look at your chart. You're basically trying to beat your own numbers, and that's that. That's really much all there is to it. You know, muscular growth happens to a long process, and it it, it just you know, it's just a matter of time. You have to have patience for it. Great. Well, well, thanks so much for coming on, Marcus. Where can we learn more about you and where you train? Do you have a YouTube channel, a Facebook page, a website? Mm -hmm. Would you please let us know? Well, the Facebook page is the uh, Facebook.com, uh, Mr. High Intensity. The same thing with YouTube, YouTube.com, Mr. High Intensity. Um, and currently, I have, like I said, I have the DVD that's out there. It's a Mr. Hit DVD. It's a two-hour DVD. Uh, I do online Skype consultations. So if you guys want to talk to me live, you can do that through my website, um, purchase it, chat with me, and we'll do it on Skype. Uh, whether you're in you know, England, Australia, I don't care where it is, um, it can all be done. And do you speak German? I speak German fluently, okay. yeah. And, um, so there you go, the German listeners. Yeah, for the German guys, yeah. Ich spreche Deutsch. <laughs> Speaking of Deutsch. Um, so, and also, and then just lastly, um, you know, Marcus is on the cover of Iron Man right now. There's actually a little bit of information on there about his training style and, you know, how it's coming back. It's actually seven pages full of it. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. <laughs> I, I actually haven't even seen it myself. I mean, but it's um, supposedly it's awesome. And it's it, it's just great for the HIT community because it truly is coming back to the forefront. And uh, hopefully, you know, it'll get to the point where that kind of science-based training will replace all the bullshit that's out there. All right. Well, thanks again, Marcus. You're welcome. Thank you very much.